Good morning students, uh, today is, is lecture 31 under module 11. Uh, in today's lecture, we will cover uh, liquid membranes. So, liquid membranes are very interesting. If you recall during the introduction class, I told you uh, that any membrane which is made up of liquid is a liquid membrane. So, they are very interesting, uh, they have lots of positive features for which uh, the researchers attention has been drawn to this particular technology. And we will discuss about the concept that different types of liquid membrane, how to prepare liquid membrane, uh, then how mass transfer happens in liquid membrane, then uh, there are applications. I will show you one case study also, uh, the work which was carried out in my own lab. So, let us begin. A liquid membrane is, uh, as I told you that it is uh, nothing but the membrane itself is a liquid. So, the concept of solid membranes uh, was extended to include membranes made up of liquid stuff such as oil or even water or any organic other organic solvents. The material for the preparation of a membrane need not be a solid only, a liquid phase existing either in supported or unsupported form. We will see and learn what is the meaning of supported and un unsupported that serves as a membrane barrier between two phases of aqueous solutions and gas mixtures. Now, let me try to explain you by showing that how we can prepare a liquid membrane in a very simple way, maybe in the lab. Okay. So, most of you have seen the YouTube manometers which are uh, used to uh, measure pressure readings. Okay. So, uh, let us say something like that, we have a YouTube manometer. Okay. Right. This is the simplest the form which I am uh, trying to uh, actually uh, draw, right. the simplest that we can make at uh, in the lab itself and you know, something like this. So, it has two limbs basically. So, you pour your membrane which is of liquid either water or oil or any organic solvent into one of the limb. So, okay, then it will come down and settle down here. Okay. So, let us say it comes and settle here. Right. So, uh, this is your liquid membrane part. So, basically here, okay. so this is your liquid membrane part. Right. So, now there is a limb 1 here, this is limb 2 here. So, in the limb 1, you will have your feed. You can uh, pass on your feed here okay. and here you will have an extract phase. Please understand that there is extra phase here, this is something extra which is not present in other membrane systems. Okay. Uh, so, this phase will basically extract the materials which we want to remove from the feed phase. Then is let us say uh, in the feed phase the solutes are there, we want to remove. The solutes will travel through this liquid membrane and will come to this phase. Okay. Now, extract phase will be chosen in such a way that this will trap this solutes which we want to remove from the feed phase and will not allow the back diffusion, will not allow the back diffusion to happen. Otherwise, it will happen that again they will transport from here to here to feed size and after some time you are seeing that again uh, you are uh, back to the original state. So, that this should not happen. So, this is how you can prepare a liquid membrane in the simplest way. Now, uh, the liquid as a separation barrier between two phases or medium where the transport occurs by the solution diffusion mechanism. The mechanism of transport is solution diffusion. In general, liquids have large diffusion coefficients compared to polymers and for certain gases they can have enormous solubility. Now, but a liquid film lacks mechanical strength. So, this is one of the most important disadvantages of this uh, liquid membranes. As such, an appropriate technique has to be adapted to stabilize the liquid membrane so that it does not get ruptured during its use and membrane defined as a is the barrier which separates two phases and restrict transport of various chemicals in a selective manner. Now, advantages are liquid membranes are highly selective as I told in the beginning of this lecture that I, I can actually target and make a liquid membrane which will remove and separate uh, the solute which we want to separate from the feed phase. So, they are very highly selective. Then we can have different modes of uh, transport also, not only restricted to solution diffusion, we can have carrier mediated transport where a particular group or carrier will help to remove the component more efficiently than that of the usual liquid membrane without having a carrier. Now, it does not require an energy, so appreciable energy savings, environmentally benign, clean technology with operational ease, it is easy to operate, replaces the conventional process like filtration and distillation, ion exchange and chemical treatment systems, okay. uh, produces high quality products, greater flexibility in designing systems with the use of carriers, this is what I was just telling, uh, specific molecular recognition can be achieved and disadvantage is stability. 
Now, the uses are uh, there are manifold uses fraction action of hydrocarbons, recovery and enrichment of heavy metal ions such as copper and mercury, removal of trace contaminants from wastewater, biochemical and biomedical field applications, membrane reactor incorporating simultaneous separation and reaction process. So, let us now uh, compare the liquid membrane with other membranes. So, unlike solid polymeric membrane, liquid surfactant membranes do not develop pinholes because of the surface tension effect associated with the surface film of liquid surfactant and do not have to be replaced or repaired. So, this is one of the biggest advantage. Then due to the absence of pinholes, no possibility of clogging of the membrane and therefore, constant filtration rate. So, there is uh, no question of any concentration polarization that is happening as in the case of solid membranes. So, possible to provide much greater surface area for mass transfer within a given process volume. Liquid membranes are much thinner than the commonly available solid polymeric uh, membranes. So, the film resistance is low. See, this is also another advantage and no film like problem. Liquid membranes are formed almost instantly and they recovered after use. So, let us now try to understand the different types of liquid membranes. Basically, we can categorize them into three different types. One is BLM which is bulk liquid membrane, second is ELM which is emulsion liquid membrane which has a lot of practical applications, then the third is immobilized or supported liquid membrane. Now, immobilization or supported liquid membrane has come into picture basically to increase the mechanical stability of the membrane right. So, the most of the liquid membranes their mechanical stability is very poor. So, to improve it, it was thought that liquid the membrane which is liquid will be impregnated inside a porous support. So, it may be another porous membrane uh, inside which you will uh, immobilize the liquid membrane and this porous membrane or support will provide the mechanical stability to the membrane. So, in this way those are either called is immobilized liquid membrane or a uh, supported liquid membrane. So, lot of uh, applications are there. So, the mechanical strength has actually increased by making supported liquid membranes or uh, immobilized liquid membranes. Well, let us say one by one. So, this is BLM, this, this is the most simplest of one which I was just showing uh, showed you in the first slide itself drawing a YouTube manometer in how we can convert it to a liquid membrane setup. Here you can see there, there is a, it is a glass beaker you can call this is a beaker type of thing. Okay. Uh, so, uh, in which we can put two different these are partition we can call it okay, made up of usually glass okay. and then your uh, organic membrane containing carrier or whatever we, without carrier also does not matter okay, containing carrier or no carrier also. Okay. So, this is your uh, part where your liquid membrane part is uh, being fixed then uh, there is a receiving phase here. Okay. So, this side and this side this is receiving phase okay. and this is from here from where you are entering your feed phase. So, there is a magnetic starter which is rotating okay, uh, to just uh, increase the enhance the rate of mass transfer right. So, this is a typical BLM setup. Now, the membrane phase is usually mixed intensively so that the diffusion path is limited to the distance of the boundary layer this is very important. So, in this case of transport of substances from aqueous solution, the membrane is an organic phase of density different than that of the water phases. A U tube cell is used, some type of carrier is placed at the bottom of the tube that is the organic membrane phase. And now, two aqueous phases are placed in the arms of a U tube floating on the top of the organic membrane with a magnetic starter rotating at a fairly slow speed okay, in the range of 100 to 300 rpm. The transported amounts of materials are determined by the concentrations in the receiving phase. So, stability is maintained as long as the starter is not spinning too quickly otherwise the liquid membrane will break. Now, these BLMs of the bulk liquid membranes do not have any commercial applications. There is in the lab scale to generate data or to characterize a particular liquid membrane that was developed. So, then the next one is emulsion liquid membrane. Now, emulsion liquid membrane is a liquid phase that separates two miscible liquid phases across it. Okay. Now, thus the liquid membrane should be immiscible in the two liquid phases being separated. So, liquid membrane phase should be in such a way that uh, there are two miscible liquid phases in between one immiscible membrane phase. Okay. Now, the type of liquid membrane either water or oil will therefore depend upon that liquid phases either oil or water being separated. Okay. Usually, it is oil water type applications basically uh, oil water separations. Okay. 
So, water and oil if mixed vigorously emulsion droplets are formed, emulsions are stabilized further by addition of some surfactants. Macro emulsions are of the size of 0.2 to 50 micron, uh, micro is uh, 0.01 to 0.2 micron. Micro emulsions more stable because the interfacial tension is negligible. This is just a schematic representation to try to understand, let us try to understand what is this. So, here whatever it is here, these are continuous phase. Okay outside this uh, emulsions. So, uh, the hatched portion what you are seeing is the membrane phase and whatever is the small bubbles you are seeing this is uh, this one this these all all these are all internal phase or we can call it as receiving phase ok. We can call it extract phase or extract phase. Now, you are understanding. So, this is your continuous phase or feed phase, okay. this is the hatching portion, okay. so this is all your membrane phase right? and inside that there is a internal phase. You can visualize at a bubble within a bubble, this is looking like na, it is a big bubble and there are so many small small bubbles, exactly it looks like this. If you take it, uh, take the emulsions and put it under a microscope and see, it just look like this. So, the innermost bubble is the receiving phase uh, and the outer bubble is the separation or skin containing the carriers, anything outside the bubble is the source phase or your feed phase. Okay. Now, uh, different types of uh, ELMs are there, uh, usually three or uh, four uh, distinct types. The first one is oil in water emulsion. So, here water is continuous phase while the oil is the discrete phase. Uh, then second is water in oil emulsion. So, here oil is continuous phase and the water is discrete phase. Then second third one is water in oil in water. So, here water and oil emulsion acts as the discrete phase and water uh, acts as the continuous phase. Another is the reverse of this oil in water in oil. So, here oil and water emulsion act as the discrete phase and oil acts as the continuous phase. So, uh, this is the emulsion liquid membrane schematic setup. Uh, you can see how actually you will uh, from this you can understand that how ELMs are prepared. Let us see here. So, this is the first chamber which is emulsification. Here, your aqueous stripping phase okay, and liquid membrane phase are mixed together, right? And then they will form uh, something like this, okay. Just what we have seen. This is what will be formed here. Then you add your feed phase here. Okay. So, then uh, there is uh, discrete phase. So, basically this is what is there here. Now, this goes to the extraction process. So, you just stir it little with very uh, low agitation uh, speed. Okay. Mm. Uh, sorry, this is not the feed phase. The feed phase is coming here. Uh, so, this is what is present here. You are putting your feed phase here and slowly stirring it. During that, uh, your mass transfer will take place and the components or the solutes which you want to transport from the uh, feed phase to that of the receiving phase will travel through the emulsion membrane phase and eventually uh, it will get inside or trapped inside the receiving phase okay. so, or stripping phase whatever it is you come. So, once that is done then you uh, leave it to a settling tank where uh, the treated waste water will be collected at the bottom and the oil rich phase will be collected and it will be sent into a de-emulsifier. So, this is a de-emulsifier. Okay. So, this is emulsifier, this is de-emulsifier, here you are making emulsions, here you are breaking emulsions. Okay. So, whatever you break it, then you got the extract phase here, the same uh, swing phase. Basically, uh, what is done here, this is breaked into this plus this. Okay. So, two different phases, one is the membrane phase okay, and this is the extract phase. Right. So, you can take the extract phase ag and again uh, put it here. Right. A stripping phase and the liquid membrane phase is being recycled to the main uh, stage. So, this is how it uh, happens. So, in industry there are uh, so many uh, emulsifiers then uh, de-emulsifiers, so, uh, various uh, settling tanks, settling tanks okay. mostly in series, they operate in series. Okay. So, the formation of emulsions has certain limitations. So, factors affecting emulsion stability must be controlled. So, this is very important. So, these factors are ionic strength and pH. So, in case during the separation the membrane loses its stability, then the separation achieved to that point is completely destroyed. So, this is one of the biggest disadvantage of these ELM membranes. So, in case let us say the separation is happening almost 30 40 percent separation is done and at the next stage you would have got 60 to 70 percent or your desired separation. In case the emulsions breaks, then you are just back to the uh, starting point.
So, after the separation there is a need to break the emulsion to recover the receiving phase and to replenish the carrier phase. Now, this is a difficult task as in order to make the emulsion stable you have to work against the ease of breaking in break it down because many times you are supplying stabilizing agents such as certain uh, surfactants to increase its mechanical strength. Now, you want to break it. So, uh, you are going against the entire forces of uh, whatever is uh, present to break it down. So, it is a top task basically. So, uh, next one is immobilized or supported liquid membrane it is either you can call it ILMs or SLMs. Now, in this case the liquid is filled inside the micro pores of a solid porous polymeric membrane just like this. Let us assume this is a micro porous support okay. and these are the pores, these are the pores, these pores are filled with the liquid membrane. It is very easy to do it in the lab actually. So, the porous membrane provides mechanical support to the liquid membrane thereby addressing the issue of stability of the liquid membranes to certain extent. Now, ILM, SLM can be easily prepared by impregnating the liquid that is the membrane phase usually organic inside the pores of a porous membrane usually hydrophobic. Now, once you have the impregnation membrane, so how do you do it? You take a um, uh, this one uh, let us say microporous membrane, microfiltration membrane basically of 0.45 micron pore size or any any pore size that is actually required ok. Then uh, what you do basically you can take it in a petri dish put the micro uh, support on that and over that you just pour uh, the membrane phase the liquid membrane phase it is either oil or uh, any or other organic uh, solvent uh, over it. So, slowly slowly by gravity what will happen the pores will get filled ok. So, this is a, a lengthy process or what we do in the labs basically we put the micro uh, support in a vacuum filtration unit and then slowly and then pour the uh, liquid membrane uh, phase over the sub surface of the membrane uh, on the micro porous support and gradually very slowly just switch on uh, your uh, vacuum filtration unit and in a controlled manner you have to do it very low pressure otherwise it will suck everything and all the membrane phase will come to the uh, permeate side. So, that should not happen. So, once it is done then you can take it out wipe it the membrane surface so that the extra liquid membrane phase whatever is present on the top surface of the membrane has to be wiped up ok. Then you either you can go for dry it or no need of drying also you can just take it and use it. So, you use it something like this ok. So, you can have a let us say some uh, sort of cell uh, system ok right. So, here you can have your liquid membrane here. So, this is liquid membrane. So, you stir it you stir is one is feed one is your receiving or extract phase. Okay. So, the, we are studying both sides just to enhance the rate of mass transfer. From here also the components should move to the liquid phase and once they come here they also should be properly trapped inside the uh, receiving phase. So, there are different types of um, supported liquid membranes, thin sheet supported liquid membranes. So, thin sheet supported liquid membrane is just a porous polymer membrane whose pores are filled with the organic liquid and carrier set in between a particular source phase and the receiving phase which are being gently stirred just to whatever we discussed. So, it can be utilized for laboratory scale, but cannot be scaled up for industrial use that is another uh, thing for this type of uh, thin sheet supported liquid membrane ok. So, hollow fiber supported liquid membrane. Now, we have discussed a lot about hollow fiber its different types of properties how it is used in different applications. So, here also we can have hollow fiber supported liquid membranes. So, the design of the hollow fiber supported liquid membrane closely resembles to a large electrical cable. So, in this membrane system the outer cell is a single non porous material and through which the materials cannot be transported inside. So, here you can see the membranes this is uh, the membrane porous support right Th these are holes basically inside which you have the liquid membrane impregnated ok. Feed is being passed from this side ok and receiving phase is outside. So, what will happen whatever it is the solute is coming here it will be transported through this and will go to the receiving phase will be transported through this liquid membrane phase and will uh, go to the receiving phase. This is how it works. So, inside the cell there are many thin fibers running the length of the cell. So, the porous the source phase is uh, piped through the system from top to bottom and the pores in the fiber themselves are filled with the organic phase. Now, the carriers in this phase then transport source across the receiving phase and then the receiving phase in forced out through the sides of the wall. 
So, let us now understand the comparison between the three different types of liquid membranes bulk emulsion and immobilized. So, bulk liquid membranes are not widely used in industry mainly due to the small contact area of the membrane with other phases and uh, very slow process kinetic. In emulsion liquid membrane there is huge surface area creation for mass transfer this is the biggest advantage of emulsion liquid membrane and extraction and stripping are achieved simultaneously. In a single step both extraction and stripping are going on. Okay, in a single operation like the conventional solvent extraction and in immobilized and supported liquid membrane system including the hollow fiber systems, the surface area and the membrane thickness provide rapid transportation, the source or receiving phases are more easily recoverable than the emulsion system, the entire source and receiving phase are not in contact with the membrane at any given time, instant leakage and contamination are easily handled. Now, let us try to understand the mechanism of mass transfer in liquid membranes. In uh, all types of liquid membranes mentioned earlier, the transport mechanism is the same and according to the film model of mass transfer, it can be divided into the following steps. The first is that diffusion through the boundary layer in the feed solution, okay. then sorption on the feed solution or liquid membrane interface. So, basically if you try to explain it, let us say this is a emulsion in which there are receiving phases and this is the membrane right. So, this is receiving phase, this is membrane phase and this is your feed phase. Now, what will happen? There will be a thin boundary layer here. Okay. So, what will happen? Initially, the solute will diffuse through the boundary layer uh, from uh, the bulk to the boundary layer. Okay. So, here once it uh, comes here then it comes uh, to this uh, uh, place which is the feed solution liquid membrane interface. Okay. It will diffuse through this then the boundary layer and on the feed side. Then transport in the membrane side okay. then once it reaches here it got transported in the this is all membrane side it transported to the membrane side that is convective uh, transport basically. Once diffusion through the membrane is happening then it will reach to the uh, diffusion through the boundary layer on the receiving side. So, there is some thin boundary layer here, then it gets transported and uh, it reaches here, it will uh, diffuse through this boundary layer and then it will get inside the receiving phase. So, disruption on the membrane or receiving solution interface, diffusion through the boundary layer in the receiving solution. This is how it happens for all different types of liquid membranes. So, broadly speaking two different types of separation mechanisms can be proposed for mass transfer in liquid membranes. So, these are simple permeation which is due to diffusive transport and then facilitated transport mechanism. Now, uh, let us understand the simple permeation mechanism. Now, since a liquid surfactant membrane is a thin film or liquid either oil or aqueous phase composed of surfactants and their solvents between a uh, feed or receiving phase, any immiscible liquid can serve as a membrane between the two liquid and gas phases containing a solute at different concentration. So, basically we are talking about a ELM here. Okay. Uh, so, if the soluble in the membrane phase and has a reasonable diffusivity through the membrane, then its selective transport through the membrane from higher to lower concentration side may be achieved. So, higher the solubility and the diffusion coefficient of the solute, more efficient will be the separation. Hence, the product of these two physical properties is a measure of the permeability of the solute through the membrane. This type of permeation is not of much technical importance and is suitable only for studies on emulsion stability, just for uh, lab scale studies basically. Because in uh, industrial parlance, where you need continuous separation, we need a higher permeability and separation. So, this is not going to help us. So, next is facilitated or carrier mediated transport mechanism. So, in this type uh, the effectiveness of separation through a liquid membrane is improved by maximizing the flux through the membrane phase and the capacity for diffusing species in the receiving phase. Now, this we can do it by two distinct um, uh, different mechanisms. The first one let us understand is uncoupled transport. Now, here what is happening? Now, extract and solute diffusion through the membrane phase to the inner phase. And then the extract which we want to remove or the solute will diffuse through the membrane phase to the inner phase. Now, extract should be soluble in the membrane phase that is very important. At internal phase boundary, extract will react with the reactant in the inner phase and forms a complex which is insoluble in the membrane phase. Now, counter diffusion is restricted, no reaction terms are involved in this type of reaction. One classic example is phenol and caustic solution separation using paraffin. So, this is uncoupled transport. So, nothing is getting coupled together okay. and the second is coupled transport. So, here an agent is used to 
uh, transfer extract from outer to inner phase called a carrier. There is a third component which is added okay, to the membrane phase. So, extract is insoluble in the membrane phase, carrier reacts with it at outer boundary to form a complex okay, which is soluble in the membrane phase, otherwise it will not transport or diffuse inside the membrane phase. Carrier is present only in membrane phase, complex diffuses towards the inner boundary where it exchanges the extract ion with the reactant present in the discontinuous phase, the carrier becomes free, it will again diffuses back. One classic example is mercury removal using oleic acid as a carrier. So, there are many such examples actually of coupled and uncoupled uh, transport. So, this is how actually it is happening. So, two components are often involved in a carrier mediated transport known as coupled transport. Okay. So, uh, component A and component B. Right. So, here two types of coupled transport are considered, first is co-coupled transport, second is counter coupled transport. In co-coupled transport, two components are moving in the same direction. Okay. So, means A and B both are diffusing in the same direction and uh, in uh, counter uh, coupled transport, two couples are moving in the opposite direction. So, just it is being uh, shown here. So, A is moving here in this direction, B is moving uh, in counter close direction. Okay. So, uh, when it comes here, okay, so it is uh, the A is bound to the carrier which forms a complex AC, then it transports to the membrane phase and once it comes to this side, it will uh, release the A and the C is back. Now, simultaneously the C is getting bound to the B also. So, B C will again diffuse from the B C complex will diffuse from this inside the membrane phase, we will release the B, we will get a B here and the C is again going back. So, this is how the counter couple transport uh, happens. So, the basic feature of carrier mediator transport is that the complexation reaction must be reversible otherwise transport will stop once all the carrier molecules have formed a complex with the solute. Right, do you get it? Na? So, if there is no carrier molecule free to bind with the solute, then um, there will be no more separation, it will reach a some sort of uh, equilibrium. So, the affinity between the carrier and the solute may vary appreciably. Thus, a strong complex that is one exhibiting a high affinity between the complex and the solute may result in a slow release, while a weak complex that is one exhibiting a low affinity between the solute and the carrier could mean that only limited facilitation occur so that the selectivity is also very small. So, uh, let us understand the transport of oxygen and nitrogen. The oxygen and nitrogen fluxes through a water film, only water okay, with and without the presence of a carrier are depicted. So, this is uh, a flux versus flux versus the feed pressure data. So, uh, the carrier in this case is as a cobalt uh, compound, this carrier molecule forms a complex with oxygen, but not with nitrogen. So, this is uh, oxygen specific carrier. So, it will form cobalt oxide basically with oxygen, but it will not react with nitrogen. So, the solubility of oxygen water is always greater than that of nitrogen and consequently a higher flux is obtained which is enhanced in the presence of a carrier molecule. So, already the solubility of oxygen is higher uh, in water than that of the nitrogen, so it will diffuse very fast. But with the presence of a specific carrier, the uh, flux will increase further. So, some oxygen molecules are transported by the carrier and others are transported by ordinary molecular diffusion or free diffusion. So, please remember that even if there is a carrier presence, it is not that only the carrier mediated transport is happening. There are some molecular uh, diffusion or ord ordinary diffusion transport is also happening without the carrier. Now, this facilitated effect is greater at lower oxygen partial pressures because the carrier will be saturated at higher oxygen partial pressure or concentration. So, you can see the flux is high with oxygen with carrier oxygen without a carrier, then nitrogen with and without carrier is the same because nitrogen is not reacting with the carrier. Okay. So, this figure tells us that what is the importance of a specific carrier mediated transport. So, ions are of interest in facilitated transport because a large number of complexing agents are available as carrier molecules especially for ion exchange components. Now, an example of coupled transport is the transport of nitrate ion. Now, to remove nitrate uh, anion from a dilute solution via a coupled transport mechanism, the other component must have a lower affinity for the carrier in comparison to nitrate, uh, otherwise it will try to uh, bind to the carrier. Okay. But this must not be too low, otherwise decomplexation becomes very difficult. So, the chloride appears to be a good component for exchange with nitrate. So, you just see this how it is happening. So, nitrate in phase uh, 1 or uh, feed, well, this is phase 1 phase 2 okay, uh, is exchanged by chlorine, whereas chloride in the phase 2 is exchanged by nitrate. 
Okay. So, uh, the nitrate anion is transported against its own driving force with the actual driving force in this process being the large concentration difference in chloride ions across the membranes. Now, please try to understand this what is happening though nitrate is having a concentration difference or concentration gradient however, that is not helping what is helping is the chloride ions concentration difference between two sides that is the driving force okay, because nitrate is binding to the chlorides. So, affinity between nitrate ion and the carrier is much higher relative to the chloride ion. Uh, decomplexation in phase 2 can occur when a very high chloride concentration is maintained. Equilibrium reaction is RCl plus nitrate equals to RNO3 plus Cl minus. Okay. So, um, this is how the counter current transport is uh, happening. You can just have a look here. Okay. So, this is the entire liquid membrane phase. Okay. This is feed phase and here it is the stripping phase. Let us now try to understand the different components of a liquid membrane. The different components are surfactant, emulsion and carrier. Now, if at all carriers are present, it is not mandatory. Okay. So, surfactants is a substance which migrate towards the interface and modifies the interface behavior. We have already discussed a little about surfactant when we have discussed MEUF or air micellar enhanced um, ultrafiltration. So, the action of surfactants, the desired property of a surfactant is that it should have a very low CMC. Okay. So, uh, non-ionic surfactants have very low CMC values are compared to ionic. Ionic surfactants will have CMC about 1 to 10 to the power of minus 10 grams per liter, whereas non-ionic surfactants will be 10 to the power of minus 4 grams per liter. So, once the interface becomes saturated, the surfactant molecules get oriented in the bulk of liquid in such a way to minimize the force of repulsion. Thus, they form micelles. We have already discussed this you can see that how micelle is forming in a hydrophilic medium, this is in a hydrophobic medium. You can see in hydrophilic medium the heads are inside the micelles okay. and in hydrophobic medium the tails are joined each other. It is not joined exactly some sort of interaction is happening okay. and this is in hydrophilic medium micelle, this is in hydrophobic medium and this is about your surface tension versus surfactant concentration. You can see this is your critical micellar concentrations this we have already discussed uh, just to again uh, make you understand easily without going back to the earlier lecture. So, the role of surfactant is to reduce the interfacial tension, reduce the amount of mechanical work that is needed to create extra surface. A uh, surfactant stabilize emulsion by forming mechanical and electrical barrier around particles. Now, relationship of surfactant structure to emulsifying behavior. Now, by changing size and structure of hydrophobic group change the hydrophobic behavior of the surfactant. Right. Similarly, change hydrophilic groups also. Hydrophilic lipophilic balance is very important, uh, it is called HLB. Uh, then depending upon this balance, surfactant activity is scaled. For purely hydrophilic material, HLB number is assigned as 20. For purely hydrophobic material, HLB is 0. Surfactants have HLB number anything between 0 and 20. And HLB number can be determined by experiments or calculatively using some uh, formula. Now, now carrier. Now, carrier is concentrated in the membrane phase, it should be dissolved <coughs> in the membrane phase, reacts with the uh, extract molecule at membrane continuous phase boundary form complex. Now, this complex diffuses through the membrane phase to the inner discontinuous phase boundary, it exchanges uh, extract molecule with discontinuous phase by virtue of the concentration difference again. The selection of carrier is very important parameter which carrier to be chosen. Now, it should be soluble in the liquid membrane, it should be non-reactive and immiscible with raffinate phase okay, or your extract phase. So, otherwise it will try to dissolve or uh, get into uh, inside the extract phase. So, readily react with the extract at continuous phase boundary, readily exchange it to the discrete phase boundary, should not react with the membrane phase. So, these are some of the properties of the carrier, so which one need to take into account when you are choosing a carrier. So, factors influencing the separation. So, for example, hydrocarbon separation, toluene and n heptane. So, based on this particular example, uh, it is uh, discussed actually how the different factors are influencing the separation. So, effect of contact time between the solvent and emulsion. So, always in any separation you know or any mass transfer that is happening or even reaction that is happening, contact time is extremely important. So, contact time should be optimized, it should not be too less, it should not be too high. Okay, there should be some optimized value. So, which needs to be find out by doing different experiments. So, separation factor increases to a maximum with increasing contact time and then decreases again. So, at the start of contact unequal distribution of large emulsion aggregates in the mixer as contact time increases and the emulsion aggregates become better distributed mass transport rate increases. With further contact because the amount of the less permeate n heptane 
uh, in the emulsion phase becomes larger. Some parts of the membrane become unstable and break and separation factor decreases. So, effect of the relative amount of the solvent. So, separation factor increases to a maximum and then decreases with increasing K. Uh, for low values of K, emulsion aggregate squalls, mass transfer area is small, K increases for the overall concentration driving force become small. Okay. So, the next is effect of the volume ratio of the surfactant solution. So, as emulsion breakage decreases, membrane becomes thick and stability of emulsion increases. Now, at R above 0.4, no further increase in the emulsion stability will be noticed. So, then effect of surfactant concentration, high emulsion breakage at concentration of 0.1 percent decreases abruptly when concentration increases up to 1 percent and decreases slowly above 1 percent. Separation factor increases to a maximum and then decreases at concentration above 1 percent. Uh, effect of mixing intensity, this also plays a very important role. Permission that increases with increasing mixing intensity, with increase in agitation speed, emulsion aggregates become smaller and well dispersed. Beyond certain rate, emulsion cannot withstand the high mechanical forces and begins to break at higher speed. Now, let us now discuss the different applications of liquid membrane. The unsupported liquid membrane has been used for removal of phenols and ammonia from wastewater and extensive experimental investigations have been carried out. The removal of these contaminants from wastewater is dictated by environmental constraints and there is an incentive to reduce the cost of water treatment which is usually carried out biologically uh, although resin adsorption can be used for removal of phenol. Separation and recovery of copper, zinc, nickel, precious metals, rare earth metals, alkali metals etc. from echo solution using LM have been studied extensively. So, phenol removal. Phenol and its derivatives are toxic and represent frequently found pollutants in surface and tap water and in wastewaters coming from various production processes like refinery, metal finishing industries, phenol is hugely present. So, an industrial plant for phenol removal from wastewater was built in China at the end of 1980s. So, this plant is capable of treating 0.5 ton per hour of solution with a phenol concentration of 100 milligrams per liter, 100 ppm. So, important parameters are surfactant concentration, sodium hydroxide concentration in the internal phase, um, sodium hydroxide is the tripping phase that will finally take the phenol inside it and will trap it and it will make sodium phenolate basically. Uh, so, then uh, volume ratio of liquid membrane phase to the internal phase, mixing intensity, temperature, type of organic solvent, stabilizer addition, solute concentration in the external phase. So, these are the parameters which is actually all optimized for this particular plant. So, a results is that a significant result of this screening was that the increase in phenol removal efficiency with the increase in surfactant concentration up to a certain value. So, it has been seen that you keep on increasing the surfactant concentration here. So, your phenol removal percentage is happening up to let us say 91 here, okay, then it decreases, right. So, it is increasing then it decreases further here, okay. So, up to 8 we can say it is fine, right. So, 91 percent phenol can be removed in a single stage process, 99.8 percent result achieved by using a two stage process. So, another example is zinc removal. So, zinc ion is used to improve weave during spinning. So, in the production of artificial silk. So, this ion is washed away during fiber ringing and is removed with wastewater, zinc is highly toxic. So, in 1986 ELM method was successfully commercialized for the first time to remove zinc from wastewater in the viscous fiber industries at uh, Lenzing AG in Austria in a plant that can treat up to 75 meter cube per hour of zinc bearing wastewater. Now, this plant was capable of removing zinc very selectively okay, from a concentration of about 200 to 300, huge concentration 200 to 300 ppm corresponding to a zinc removal efficiency of greater than 99.5 percent. Three other ELM based industrial plants for zinc removal are also working. So, they are uh, at Glassop in Austria with a capacity of 700 meter cube per hour, CFK Swartz at Germany with a capacity of 200 meter cube per hour and Exo Ede in Netherlands with a capacity of 200 meter cube per hour. So, then next one is cadmium removal. So, cadmium is found in industrial liquid uh, coming from different industries such as manufacturing of cadmium nickel batteries, pigments, coatings, phosphate fertilizers and electroplating uh, 
uh, industries. In 2010, approximately 85 percent of cadmium compound mainly a sulphide and oxide and hydroxide have been used in the production of cadmium nickel batteries. So, as a result of the high toxicity of cadmium which can cause dangerous environmental impact as it uh, affects both the aquatic as well as human life, removal of cadmium was done with ELM and TOA that is uh, trioctyl amine was used as the mobile carrier. So, the results that is obtained are the optimum concentration of surfactant was found to be 3 percent okay, for this particular application d emulsifier 0 0.4 molar was used to maintain the stability. The removal efficiency increased with carrier concentration. So, as the concentration carrier concentration is increased from 0 0.02 to 0 0.04 you see the removal efficiency increased from 70 percent to 99 percent. So, excellent removal is obtained. Then another case is arsenic removal. Arsenic is a big menace in uh, Asian, some of the Asian countries, especially Indo-Bangladesh border. So, water contamination with harmful arsenic compounds represents one of the most serious calamities of the uh, last two centuries. Natural occurrence of the toxic metal has been revealed recently for 20 current countries. Worldwide, the risk of arsenic intoxication particularly high in Bangladesh, India and European countries. So, results is that the best result uh, uh, on the recovery of arsenic 3 corresponding to a recovery of above 95 percent was obtained by adopting the following operational conditions. Internal phase is 2 molar uh, potassium hydroxide, membrane phase is 6 percent volume by volume L113A this is a particular organic component and 4 percent by volume by volume liquid paraffin. External phase is 4 uh, ppm arsenic 3 and 7 m hydrochloric acid, 7 molar hydrochloric acid, uh, phase ratio is 2 oil into 3 internal and 1 emulsions to 5 water, agitation speed is almost 400 rotations per minute and 10 minutes is the extraction time that was given. Okay. So, another case is bisphenol A is an endocrine disrupting uh, chemical is an important chemical used principally as a monomer in the production of polycarbonates, epoxy resins and other uh, plastics. It is very uh, it's a big nuisance in the baby feeding bottles actually uh, for which there is a hue and a lot of hue and cry. So, it is non biodegradable and resistance to chemical degradation. It has been detected both in industrial wastewaters and in surface waters at concentration levels that are of environmental concerns because it represents a risk to humans and wildlife. Uh, das and uh, Hamarawi in 2010 studied the extraction of BPA from aqueous solution using an ELM. So, the effects of the main experimental conditions affecting the stability of the prepared oil water emulsion are surfactant concentration, emulsification time, internal phase concentration, volume ratio of the internal phase to the organic phase, 98 percent tube valve was observed with excellent emulsion stability. So, very quickly I will show you one of the case study which was done by one of my PhD students uh, Dr. Santhi Raju Pili. So, what he has done is that he has removed endocrine uh, disrupting chemical uh, here it is endosulfon okay, from uh, wastewater using a ionic liquid based supported liquid membrane. Okay. Now, let us quickly go through. So, endosulfide is highly toxic. Okay. So, um, it is staggering trouble in breath, it creates staggering trouble in breathing, uh, vomiting, gastrointestinal tumors, hyperactivity, tremors, convulsions, lack of coordination and unconsciousness if you are continuously being exposed to endosulfon. And you can see this time weighted average and short term exposure levels is very high. So, human poisoning incident is already reported. The lowest reported does that cause death is 35 milligrams per kg of body weight. So, you can understand that this is highly toxic. So, what we did is actually we took, took actually ionic liquids as one of the component of the membrane phase. So basically, the membrane phase is ionic liquid. So, um, ionic liquids are very interesting solvents. They are actually salts made up of one cationic group, one anionic groups. We can choose a particular cation and choose a particular anion, fuse them together, you will get an ionic liquid. So, at room temperature, there are room temperature ionic liquids which are called actually RTIL. Okay, room temperature ionic liquid. So, they are uh, liquid at room temperature. Okay. Uh, so, we have used mostly RTILs. So, uh, there are n number of ionic liquids available both commercially as well as you can prepare. So, which ionic liquids to choose for our particular application. So, that is why we have done some theoretical calculations. I will not go into detail about this. So, we used one Cosmo RS model. Okay, this is based on activity coefficient thermodynamic concept actually and you find out the selectivity using this equation. Right. So, what you get is something like this. 
Okay. So, these are selectivities values at infinite dilution and ambient temperature for imidazolium, pyridinium, ionic liquid with alpha endosulfone. Okay. So, you can see then whichever is best, let us say this is best here in this particular case. In this particular case, let us say this is best, you take this ionic liquids. See, if this is not commercially available, then we have gone for the next one, which is uh, the next selective, highest selective one, okay, or whose selectivity is the second highest, okay, and see if it is available commercially, then take it. So, this is how we have done some theoretical calculation. So, let us not, anyway not go into that. So, applications of Cosmo RS as pre selecting tool for ionic liquid for removal of uh, EDCs. It is IELTS found which are exposed to dissolve EDCs better than commonly used IELTS. The smaller the value of the activity coefficient, the stronger is the interaction between the solute and the ionic liquid. 984 possible ionic liquids we have screened. So, this is done using simulation, okay, so here theoretical uh, screening. So, this is the selectivity order. The TBP is one particular ionic liquid, is the highest followed by uh, TIBMP and so on. So, since we do not have a uh, this ionic liquids available commercially, so we have gone for the C4 DMIM PF6 was chosen for our experiment. It is a imidazolium based ionic liquid with hexafluorophosphate as the ion. So, this is your cationic group, this is your uh, anionic group. Okay. So, then we have to prepare the supported ionic liquid membrane. So, um, we have prepared as I have just told you in uh, few uh, slides before how to prepare uh, supported ionic liquid membrane. So, then you have to measure the flux okay, using this equation minus V by A dc by d8 rate of permeation. Okay. Let us see how it has been prepared done the experiments. So, SLM uh, experiment. So, we have a magnetic stirrer a plate something uh, like this. Okay. Then what? Then we have uh, clamps fixed into that um, magnetic stirrer. Then we have two different cells, glass cells. So, you can see this is one glass cell here which has come here. Okay. Then we have placed the supported ionic liquid membrane to the mouth of the glass, uh, the first glass chamber, let us say the glass chamber 1. Okay. Then another glass chamber comes, so let us see this is glass chamber 2. Okay. Then it is fitted and clamped to the setup. Okay, so, we have transferred the feed phase here and we have transferred the receiving phase here. So, feed phase is uh, endosulfone in aqueous medium and stripping phase is your sodium hydroxide. Okay, then it will be stirred. Then it is stirred, magnetic stirrer bar, okay, it is stirred and uh, this is closed and then uh, stirring takes place, then your diffusion will start. This is the experimental setup for the transport experiment. Okay. So, the membrane area is 12.5 square centimeter, centimeter square, small membrane area in the lab scale. So, 3 ml of the samples are drawn from feed and permeate at 4 hour interval for UV analysis. Okay. Then pH and of the feed and permeate are measured every 4 hours using pH meter because since uh, endosulfone is moving, so the pH of the feed as well as the receiving phase is keep on changing need to adjust that. Okay. We have adjusted the pH also, we have done some control experiments without adjusting the pH also. So, transport experiments is carried out for uh, 24 hours, then membrane weight is noted after the experiment again to find out the loss of IL to see and to understand how uh, effective is this supported ionic liquid membranes. Why we have chosen ionic liquid? Basically, they are green solvents. Okay. Second thing is that they are highly viscous. So, if the liquid membrane viscosity will be more high or will be higher, then its impregnation inside the porous membrane or the pores of the membrane support will be better. So, that is the idea actually. So, this uh, let us just quickly go through. These are some of the results of the experiments basically. You can see that uh, here uh, the concentration, these are the concentration of the feed endosulfone, how it is decreasing in the feed set and this is how it is increasing in the receiving side. Okay. This is same plotted in a different way. Then uh, with uh, different 0.1 uh, molar sodium hydroxide, okay. then uh, this one ammonium hydroxide as uh, using as an, another uh, stripping phase. Okay. So, variation in endosulfone concentration in feed and strip phase as a functional operating time. So, at time how? Okay. So, we have seen that almost after 24 hours, no more change is there. So, we have stopped at 24 hours. So, this is with different stripping solution. You can see that uh, we have uh, ammonium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide 0 0.1 molar, sodium hydroxide 0 0.1 molar with feed pH uh, adjusted to 2. So, this particular has given the best uh, separation more than close to 90 percent separation. Okay. So, we have used that as the uh, stripping phase. So, this is the mechanism actually how what is happening. So, this is again try to understand uh, this is one type of carrier mediated transport. Okay. You can call it as a facilitated transport here. Okay. Uh, here the ionic liquid groups 
uh, are behaving as actually a carrier. So, the aldosol bond which is actually negatively charged when it comes then uh, he, this is source bed it comes and sit here on the membrane and uh, feed interface then diffuse to the membrane phase and bind to the ionic liquid phase. So, you will get I L H plus E L minus this is an inter intermediate complex another it intermediate complex is not stable. Okay. So, then it is moving in this direction by virtue of the concentration difference what it comes here at the interface of the receiving phase and the membrane phase. So, by virtue of your uh, concentration difference it will break and it will remove the endosulfone. The endosulfone will bind to the sodium hydroxide whatever it present here and will give you Na plus E s minus so it is becomes a salt. Okay. Since the molecular uh, weight of this particular component is uh, much higher there will be no big back diffusion. So, back diffusion is been discarded out. Okay. So, I hope you will understand uh, how actually we have carried out uh, the experiment. So, in a nutshell we can say that aim of this work was to remove endosulfone from aqueous solution using the supported ionic liquid membrane. So, maximum weight loss of the membrane after experiment was 4.4 percent. Okay. So, we can say that it is favorably stable. So, C4 DMIM PF6 with PVDF is used, PVDF is the support, polyvalent diphloroethylene uh, porous support was used okay. and uh, this particular ionic liquid with 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide gave the highest permeation that is 87 percent at pH 2 and 71 percent at pH 6.5 that means without changing the pH. So, lowest permeation was 55 percent at pH 10 the influence of pH effect of initial feed concentration and effect of stirring speed was studied stripping agents used is sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide and ammonium hydroxide and best stripping agent was 0.1 m sodium hydroxide. So, I hope you have uh, got a test of how these liquid membranes were being used experimentally to remove certain compounds. Uh, with this uh, I conclude today's uh, lecture. So, mostly it is taken from uh, this Kenneth and Mulder uh, for liquid membrane. Okay. So, please refer these books and uh, in the next class we will be discussing about gas separation. So, on different types of membranes and modules used for gas separation, how the transport happens inside and during gas separation and factors that affect gas separation and various applications. So, thank you very much. In case you have any query, please feel free to write to me at kmohanthi at itg.ac.in. Thank you very much.